This is The Storied Outdoors, a podcast somewhere between Lewis and Tolkien and Lewis and Clark, finding clarity in the stories we tell and the adventures that shape us. Welcome to the Storied Outdoors. My name is Brad Hill, and I am joined, as always, by my good friend and co-host, Brian Gill. And we're joined today by Sam Bailey. He's the uh, advertising director for Southern Culture on the Fly. He also sells explosives. We might get into that, or we may not get into that. But <laughs> he's married. Uh, he's married. He has uh, two children. Uh, he's an avid outdoorsman. I think that maybe. As I stalked your Instagram, Avid Outdoorsman doesn't quite seem like it is encompassing enough for all the things that I've seen you do on Instagram, but I know you're a fly fisherman. You love fly fishing. You, uh, you guys, uh, you work with Southern culture on the fly, you know, talks about fly fishing and tells stories. Um, man, you've caught all kinds of fish. You've been all over the place. Um, you're a fellow creative as, as you sell advertising for a very creative magazine. I've enjoyed seeing the things that you guys do. We're happy, uh, to have you join us today, Sam. So thanks for taking some time out of your schedule to, to partner with us. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I mean, you guys have done an awesome job with this podcast you're doing and it's really an honor. Y'all have had some pretty big names on here. So I feel like I'm just a little, a little guy in the sea that Jimbo, whew, that's a, that's always tough to follow up. I wish you would have asked Woo. me to do this like last year before <laughs> that. <laughs> no, man. I mean, whew. yeah. Well, who, yeah, want, who wants we, to follow matter, man? <laughs> I know it. <laughs> you know, I, I think about, you know, Brad and I are the same way. You know, we, we're 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 just a couple of guys from Alabama, and, and we we like to tell stories. And I think it's the you know we we always got to go back to that untold story is kind of where we want to fall, and and we want to tell those. And so, man, we're just so thankful that you're on this on this podcast with us. Um, we were talking just a little bit before we started recording, um, just kind of how you kind of landed where you are, and and you know kind of how you got into the the outdoors. So you know you. Know, you you live in Georgia now, had a little bit of time in Alabama, a little bit of time in Florida. You've kind of been all around the South. Um, what is your, what was your introduction to the outdoors? Well, uh, I mean, my parents, my grand, my dad and my grandfather, they, uh, they got me into it. I've got a picture of myself, probably about two years old, a year and a half old, standing creek, holding the bluegill in the middle of when it looks yes. like probably during deer season, honestly. <laughs> but uh, that's, you know, I, I do not remember a, a time in my life where hunting and fishing was not a part of it. Uh, I've got more pictures holding, holding squirrels and shooting guns and uh, with my, with my, you know, my family. So it, it's always been a part of it. It's something that's, uh, I don't know. It's weird. It's just, I don't know what my life would be without it. It's, it's hard to think part of your DNA, it. huh? It is. It's in, it's just, it's me. You know what uh you know what old Wade Blevins says that old bluegill is the gateway drug. It is. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> <laughs> it never gets old either, does it? No, it's it's you. Are, it's the same every time. I love them. <laughs> so much fun. Gosh, I, I'll take a give me a cane pole or a brim pole and and some some crickets and I will sit for hours, man. That that was what I that was kind of my introduction to that and you know a little chicken liver and catfish on a Zepco thirty. <laughs> You know, it's so funny you said the bluegill. Is I, last year I was, I just threw a three weight in my truck. I was tra I travel quite a bit for my job, and I was going through, and I had a little free time in the afternoon. And I just, I literally stopped on the side of the road at a creek I've never seen before, and I jumped out of the creek and uh, I headed in into the woods and just caught bluegill for like an hour on the side of the road for kind of a lunch break deal, and I was like this is getting back to it it's so awesome so that's amazing <laughs> that's awesome so but, you hey just real quickly for real like you you guys sell you, you're a salesman for not only southern culture on the fly but you sell explosives i do that's an unorthodox job title let's be real it is yes <laughs> uh so yeah it's um i, I got into that 
Uh, I don't want to just gloss yeah. over that. Yeah. That's not one of those. That's not one of those things where somebody's like churching up your job. Like you know how people will do. You know, like you know, I'm a drug. You know, I'm a drug dealer. No, you're not. You're a pharmacist. But yeah, you made right. it sound made it sound darker than it really is. Like when you say you sell explosives, like what, what do you mean here? Yeah. Well, so uh, explosives for the mining industry. Oh. Um, so we do, uh, you know, blasting and rock quarries. Uh, Back in the day when I first started, we did coal mining, gold mines, um, but rock quarries are kind of the main thing now. And then construction blasting. A lot of my customers uh, with this new company that I'm with are in the construction. They So they're blasting for roadways and, you know, big commercial buildings and thing, things like that. Wow. That's that's pretty cool. That's yeah. It's that's neat, a, but it's, it's, not quite, it's, it's not quite as uh, crazy as it sounds like it is. <laughs> yeah, well, it's still unique, though. I mean, it is. That's pretty cool. It made me think about, for some reason, uh, maybe this is totally off subject, but I think it was Brian Regan when he was talking about going on a road trip somewhere, and there there was a sign on the road that said "blasting zone," and he's like, "Shouldn't that read road closed?" Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it's pretty safe. You know, they just want you to know. <laughs> yeah, just want you to know, yeah. man. So, I mean, it's one thing to grow up in the outdoors, catching brim shooting guns and stuff. It's another thing to get into fly fishing for large portions of the South fly fishing. is still sort of a, I mean, still pretty niche, even though it's grown a lot. I think we would all agree that it's grown tremendously over the last of last few years, but for the most part, it's still pretty, pretty niche. How, how did you get into the fly fishing? It first started with my grandfather when I was a kid, uh, he loved to fly fish for bluegill and, uh, you know, on the bed. So in the summer times, we had a couple of old uh, eagle claw, the yellow eagle claw yes. fiberglass rods. Had a few of those, and we'd go uh, in the John boat and go hit brim beds. And I always liked, uh, I mean, the brim were awesome, obviously. And we were catching big old, just, I mean, big hand size, you know, shell crackers and bluegill in those mm. ponds. But I always liked to throw it around the treetop and catch, you know, catch a bass. Um, so did that growing up. And then I didn't kind of got out of it, I'd say around 10 or 11, 12, um, and picked it back up when I was 21. Uh, mm-hmm. I just moved back from Colorado and my plan was out there was to fly fish and, uh, just things didn't work out for me. What, what I was hoping they would mm-hmm. and, uh, moved back, uh, to the Southeast, lived in Florida for the summer and came, came back to Birmingham and, uh, got my first fly rod. So or I say my first lot, my first fly ride. The other ones were my grandfather's. So it was my first fly ride. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. My, my first, the first time I ever saw a fly rod was, um, my, my granddad on my mom's side and my dad were fishing in Lake Eufaula and they were fishing on the bottom. Just, I don't know, fishing some kind of a heavy sinker or something. I don't know what they were doing. And my granddad caught two fly rods from the bottom of Lake Eufaula <laughs> and they brought them what? up. They came home with no fish, but like a lantern and two fly rods. And like, <laughs> I was like, what in the world is that? Like, I've never seen one of those things before. <laughs> so, That's amazing. Like, how yeah. do they get in the bottom of you? Somebody had a bad day. Somebody had a real bad day. That was, uh, <laughs> yeah, the rest of the boat was down there where those things. Yeah. Were. <laughs> <laughs> they did say something that, uh, that you know, one broke their line. And so I'm guessing that was the boat. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. We, uh, so I'm getting my seasons mixed up on me, Brian, but we, uh, I think it was last season that we got to spend some time over at our, our good friend, Craig Haney's. Yes. And, uh, and we realized, I think you realized there was a connection with Craig and with Sam. Yeah. So that, you know, the first time Sam, we, we met Sam, I think was in, um, was it Atlanta? At, in Atlanta at the, fl- at the film, uh, film tour. I think it was, um, uh, just not a fly sure fishing which, show, a fly it? fishing it show, show in Atlanta. Yeah. And uh, we, we went by the um, Southern Cultural on the Fly booth and then, you know, kind of introduced ourselves and things like that. And then we're talking to Craig Haney in his in his man room down there in his basement. And he mentions you and y'all had like this long, long friendship. And so we're like, oh, man, man, that's two times we've we've met, you know, come across Sam. Let's let's get him on the show. And so can you tell us a little bit about your your how you and Craig kind of met and, and y'all's friendship from that point on. Yeah. So, uh, 
kind of goes back to when I moved back from Colorado. I'd, I'd actually gone in the deep south and bought a fly rod um, from Rob and uh, David Diaz. And uh, I was in Homewood one day <clears throat> and I ran across this little fly shop and it was River Woods Outfitters. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I'm going to go check it out. So I walked in and there was Craig Haney in there and Missy Robertson and, and came, you know, was hanging out all the time, just two great people um, and just soaking up knowledge, hanging out every day after work in between uh, my lunch breaks, anytime I had. And so I was in there one day and I'd been in there a month now, hanging out as much as possible. And I know just a Craig, shop rat. I mean, people yeah, just a shop rat. Oh, yeah. shop rat. Yeah. <laughs> Unpaid, <laughs> you know, bothering Craig to death. I'm sure. I'm sure he was like, God, oh, I wish I could get this kid out of here. So he probably thought that's I exactly what he thinking. He said, Hey, Sam, I got some customers in here. They're trying to look at some fly rods. I'm busy. Can you go out with them? He'll make yourself he's useful. Like, yeah. He's going to put me to work and I'm going to be like, No, nah, I'm getting out of here. Well, so I go outside, you know, cast the rods with the people and, um, <laughs> and come back in they buy the rod so nice. next time i'm in there craig's like hey i've got a i've got to run out real quick can you watch the store for a minute i'm like yeah sure i'll glad to watch the store uh so i watched the store for him um you know that keeps going on for the next month or so and then one day i get a call from craig and he's like hey sam can you uh what do you got going on this weekend i'm not doing anything this weekend he's like you can you watch the shop for us? Can you can you work? And I'm like, yes, sir. So I go in. He's talking to me. He's like, all right, well, come in, you know, and we're gonna go over some stuff. Like, okay. And he's like, Missy and I are going to ICAST. We need you to just run the shop for us for the weekend. I'm like, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> I got the keys of the castle. You're jumping in the deep so, end there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, all of a sudden, you know, there I am working the shop, and uh, it was awesome. I mean, I loved it. It taught me all, all about you know talking to people about fly fishing, you know, fly rods. Greg taught me so much. We would go fishing before, before work. Uh, he and I would meet up and we'd go to the locust fork or the mulberry fork and uh, catch bass and bluegill, you know, on the fly and then head to work. It's just, he was uh, kind of an adopted father like figure mm -hmm. to me. Uh, I just, I love him to death and you know, he's just a great man. So. Yeah, man. We love that guy. Yeah. yeah he's one of the, he He's not short on stories, man. I love no. hearing every story he had. I mean, those 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 guys are so rich, and um, you know, uh, the more we can record those stories, the better this world will be. Yeah, one hundred percent. I love it. Yeah, we had we had the privilege of spending a week in Montana. His first time never fished Montana. This was back in two thousand and fourteen or thirteen. Excuse me. Um, we had a good friend. It was a customer of the shop. Uh, Billy Ray and and Dr. Ray had moved, had retired. He was a um, a dentist, and he had retired from his dentist practice and moved to Montana to Bozeman. Oh, had wow. an awesome little place out there, and I just happened to run into him one day um, on the river out of the blue. I saw him, and I was like, "Billy Ray." And he was like, <laughs> Sam Bailey, what are you doing out here? And <laughs> I was I was living there at the time, so that uh, is random. Yeah, it was just totally random. So we we started talking and kept in touch and devised a plan to to get Craig to Montana. He had been he had been sick, and so uh, we we this, got this it round. Did he had cancer? Did he, he survived right. cancer, didn't he? So yes, sir. Wow, it was around that time. I, th I think it was either the cancer. He also had some heart stuff going on, but yeah, it was it was either the heart stuff or the cancer. But he had been really sick, and he he didn't think he was going to make it. Um, mm. And and so he had gotten over. We put it all together, got him to Montana, and like I said, I had the privilege of getting to row them down the river uh, a couple of days. Um, awesome. We did a couple of wade wading days. Uh, did some float boats um, in a lake one day. It was just it was just an awesome awesome week to get to spend with those guys and met another you know another like come full circle met a, a guy uh, Dr. Henry Dowling who was one of Billy Ray's. Um, good friends from dental school who was a dentist in Mississippi. And he and my father 
grew up together in Tuscaloosa and were best friends through high school. And I'd never met him. They lost contact after high school because in the 60s, there were no cell phones or Instagram or (laughs) Facebook or anything. No LinkedIn or, you know. (laughs) Exactly. So uh, he was like, he he just, it it was just kind of a small world, you know. Wow. And uh, got to fish with him. So it was just an amazing trip. Amazing trip. When we met Craig, Brad and I were in, um, in in the Orvis store here there in 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 uh at the summit and and we started talking to Craig about our trip coming up to to Hazel Creek and it was you know Craig was telling us where to go he told us where the campsites were he told us what to take he told us what time to hit the ferry all these things you know unfortunately that trip never happened but you got a connection with Hazel Creek and Craig too don't you oh yes yes so working in the shop Craig, uh, I, I wasn't paid. I was the, I was the unpaid shop rat. Even after, uh, you know, working while they went to ICAST and everything else, I, w- I was not paid. I had another job, so I was doing it because I loved it. And I was getting a discount on everything, which was like getting paid for me. So uh, we're getting ready for a big trip to Hazel Creek, customer trip. Got a bunch of people going. And Greg comes to me. He's like, hey, Sam, I got something for you. Like, okay, cool. He pulls out a brand new St. Croix Legend Ultra three weight and a um, and a uh, T Bore Spring Creek reel three weight mm-hmm. reel line backing everything. I was like, I'm, Craig, I can't afford this. He's like, No, this is for all the work you've been doing. I've been keeping up with all your hours. This is your pay. I'm oh like, man, wait a minute. No, and he's like, Yes, yes. So we went to Hazel Creek. I mean, I still have that rod today and real still use it all the time. It, it's, it's awesome. But that's how Craig was, you know, Craig would, uh, he knew at the time they just couldn't afford to pay me and he was keeping up with everything. And he, he ended up giving me four different rod and reel setups. All of them were like top of the no- top notch. I mean, two Orvis T3s with, you know, bat and kill large arbor reels, um, the St. Croix and there's another one, another, I think, a. Anyways, I can't remember right now, but those were the three most meaningful ones because each one of them was for a big trip we had coming up. So, oh, that's Gosh, awesome! Man, what a, I'm, in some ways, looking back, man, that may almost be better than you know having been just paid regular. Oh yeah, eventually I started getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you have these like those are treasures. You know, and like, you know those oh, yeah. are things too that if you take good care of them and the, you know you got them. That's it. Oh, I still have all of them. Uh, they're all in the basement right now. And I use, you know, use most of them uh, fairly regularly. So that's incredible. Yeah, I'll, I'll never get rid of those. Though. Well, wow. heck, no. heck no. Tell us about, <clears throat> we've, we've talked about Southern culture on the fly. Tell us about uh, what, what is Southern culture on the fly and, uh, and what is, uh, what is this thing you're, you guys are trying to accomplish with it? So, you know, the short, you know, the short answer is short, Southern Culture on the Fly is a an online um, free online magazine, but really Southern Culture on the Fly it's it's a culture, it's a community that we are you know has has been built and that we are continually trying to grow. You know, it's just it's so much more than it's everything. It's you guys, it's everybody that is in this fly fishing um, you know community in the southeast. Or, or is from the Southeast. You know, we've got people from all over the country and other, other countries that are reading it and, and buying our merch and everything else. So that's awesome. It's it's very cool. It's, it's beautifully done. I mean, that the way it's laid out, the storytelling, everything about it is, it's really, really a, a great, great look. I mean, um, the stories are compelling. I mean, and, now, did you guys start that, or did y'all did y'all acquire it? How? What is? So, uh, Dave Grossman and Steve Steinberg are two guys uh, from Asheville, North Carolina. Well, they live in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, they're super creative and just amazing people. Uh, they started it in 2010 and oh. uh, grew it. This was their brainchild, their love child, and and it was uh, something that I was a fan of. Um, loved it. They would have you know obviously it's quarterly so four issues a year you're always looking forward to them great stories a very um it started off very raw uh kind of you know graffiti punk rock uh fly fishing magazine feel um with a very strong you know southern base 
and um, and it's grown through the years. Amazing, amazing writers and photographers and artists have been in it and been a part of it. And uh, so last year, um, John Agricola called me. I was like, hey, have you seen the new issue? And I'm like, uh, I, yeah, I saw it. But wow, what's up? He's like, well, it's the penultimate issue. I'm like, yeah, I know. You know how Dave is. He's like, well, read into it a little further. I was like, okay. So I I went back and, and read some stuff that I'd probably skipped over. Man, sounds like they're, this might be it. So he's like, I think, I think they're, they're done with it. I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's do some research. Let's make some phone calls and come to find out they were, they were uh, just kind of at a, at a place in their lives where, you know, they were at the end of their creative journey with it and they didn't really want to sell it. They didn't really want to turn it over to any, just anybody. And, hmm. um, and, and thankfully and fortunately, uh, I had built a relationship with those guys years ago um, and had kept in touch, you know, a little bit here and there. And um, thankfully, when we talked to them, they were very willing to listen to what we had to say and, and, and liked what we had to say about it and wanting to keep it alive and uh, were, allowed us to uh, make a deal and purchase it, keep it going. So they're both – Dave's really been uh, – he's helped out with some things. You know, he was at the fly show with us last year. He's been writing some stories. Um, he'll continue to help us with a story here and there and uh, hopefully some photography. Steve is a, most people don't know it, but Steve, he's a pretty famous artist. He's, he does these giant, you know, art shows all over the world. Hmm. And so he's pretty busy. Um, he hasn't been able to do a whole lot wow. uh, photography wise uh, for us yet, but we're hoping to get some more of his stuff in there. Cause he's, Man, he's such an amazing artist. Yeah, it's it's pretty neat his photography and stuff. But but the new look of the magazine has changed some. Um, we think for the better. It's it's maybe a little more polished than it was before. And, and oh, it's, it's beautiful. That's all Hank. Uh, man, Hank's he's a genius when it comes to putting that stuff together. He does such a great job. Yeah, well, yeah. I can I, mean, I can tell. There's Hank, a, there's... Hank's bait shop. Hank's oh. Hank's bait shop. Hank. Okay, yeah, to make Hank sure Hershey, we're talking about the same doctor. Doctor Chocolate. Doctor Hershey. <laughs> that's, I think he said his father in law calls him that or somebody calls him that. He said the other day and I was dying when he said it. But, his uh, father in law and I go way back. Okay, yeah. nice. Yeah. Priceless. We wanted to get him on the show too. So yeah. but uh, that's so Dr. Cool. Chocolate. So so in the magazine, just you know, we've got uh there's there's six of us. Um, there's, yeah, I was going to ask you who the team is. So the team is John Agricola. He is our managing uh, member and editor. Uh, we have Michael, Dr. Michael Steinberg, who is a professor at the University of Alabama, who is also – he's our conservation editor. Cool. Um, Hank, Dr. Dr. Hank Hershey, is uh, our creative and art director. So he puts it all together. Um, Scott Stevenson – um, he is our merchandise and kind of a creative and merchandise director. And he also does some writing. And then uh, Alan Broyhill is, you know, definitely last but not least. Uh, Alan was the first intern for Scoff uh, back in 2010 or 11. He started working with Scoff back then. He lives in Brevard, North Carolina. And Alan is just a super talented guy. He's a guide. Um, he's a beautiful brilliant photographer um he's one of my very close friends and and he is uh he's kind of our bridge from old scoff to new scoff and he's a computer you know wizard kind of like hank too and he knows a lot of the social media aspects and um like i said photography and videography he's very good at all that stuff he's also our going to be our podcast guy because he is really good with putting the podcast together so when is that coming out we were supposed to start recording this week, but uh, that got there's a little uh, wrench thrown in it. So, well, we'll let see. us know because we want to we want to push people yeah, to we'll it. Put, Definitely, we'll, we'll do. Yes, it's uh, hopefully we'll have it, the first one coming out. We're hoping in February. Awesome. We're going to kind of start it with uh, the fiftieth issue. So, fiftieth well, issue, fiftieth issue. Yeah, the fiftieth issue of the magazine will be February, um, about the third week in February. So, so cool. if you were going to sum up scoff like the purpose in in like one phrase what would what would you say everything that matters 
everything that matters. Okay. <laughs> one sentence, but yeah, that's it. It's everything that's, that matters. Uh, that's a that's a pretty pretty broad brush. I like that. That's you, cool. You said something really interesting that I w- I didn't think about asking until you said it, but you talked about it, you know the early parts of it being like punk rock. Um, you know, edgy, a little edgy. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? What um, yeah, just, um, some of the, I think some of the stuff, you know, obviously everybody's a little different. Um, in, in that old, that old style had kind of that skater, um, mag, maybe not as the photography was a little bit more raw back then. Um, and you know, lots of the painting, you, you had like almost graffiti art, you know, ish, yeah. uh, stuff in the issues. And, um, it, it was, it was awesome. I loved it. Something. And I still love it. You know, I still go back and look at those old, those old issues. Some, um, it's, I think it's just the difference in the creative mind of, of Dave and Steve, when they were putting something together in the creative mind of Hank, it Hank's a little bit more polished, uh, look than, um, ease of reading look than it was before. I think it's be interesting to hear from you, Sam, about, cause I think you, I, you'll get it. Uh, something Brian and I have talked about, not so much on the, like on the podcast, but we've talked about uh, privately before is something I've noticed. Like when we go to these shows, there are two distinct, very distinctly different groups of people <laughs> at a fly shop or at a fly show. Right. There, there's, the, there is that, that punk rock group now, which feels pretty new. Right. You know, we got some dreads, we got a, a bunch of tattoos. I'll pick on my buddy, uh, Peter, uh, Peter down here at the Lost Angler over in Daphne, like Peter is like, he's right next to a tattoo parlor and a CBD store and he's a fly shop. I was like, this couldn't be more appropriate. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. So you've got that group and then there's, then there's like that sort of Orvis, you know, much more, uh, um, you know, I, I don't know what the term would be up at let's say uppity or right. bougie, bougie group that, you know, They've got on their their pressed button down shirts and their brush pants and their shirts tucked in. They may be a little scruffy, but for the most part, they're very business like and mm-hmm. and pretty posh. And so, and then there's you know there's people in 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 the middle there. What is it about fly fishing that connects with those two vastly different demographics of people? You know, that's that's a. I don't know what it is that that makes each of them gravitate to it. I think it's, it's something different. It's not, it's not your run of the mill thing, right? It's everybody, anybody can go grab, uh, you know, a spinning rod and do it. It takes time. It takes effort to learn to fly fish. Mm -hmm. So whether that's, you want to be a little, you're, you're on the edgy side of things. You know, you're that skater, that tattoo, that punk rock dreads, whatever guy, right. And you want to, you want to do something a little bit different, a little bit different than the mainstream. So you do it or you, you know, maybe that businessman, he's like, I want something a little bit more challenging. Yeah. I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what brings different people to it. I don't even know what brought me to it other than I just thought it was cool. And I was like, I want to try something different. Cause I, I mean, I'd bass fish, you know, my whole life. And I mean, that's like, that's fish. like Brian's story. I mean, Brian's sitting there with a man's bait shop yeah. hat on right. growing up over there with the plastics and the, what's right. the, wasn't that like the bass fishing capital of the world over there? Oh, yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. My, my I think what's best cool friend about- growing up, his dad was the VP at, at man's, you know, I mean, it was nice. like nothing have man's and they had Southern plastics and like between the two of them, it was, you know, 80 to 90% of all the lures made in the world were came through you follow. Yeah, I think I still got like six packs in the garage of the <laughs> giant ten inch jelly worms. Yes. Yeah. Great. Hey, hey you can use any color best. any color you want, right, Brian? As long as it's purple. As long as <laughs> it's it. purple. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I've you just been fascinated cute. by that though, Sam. I, you know, I, when you look around at those things, like, man, they are very, very different people. It at is these these shows and and in these stores or whatever. One thing that I think is neat about uh, fly fishing, and, and you find it in some other many kind of niche things, but in fly fishing, you have those two groups, right? But at the same time, you'll have those two groups sitting down, having a cup of coffee or a beer or whatever yes. in the same boat, and just enjoying each. It doesn't matter. You'll have a guy that is a a billionaire businessman 
that will be in the same boat as a guy that's, you know, you're just dirtbag fisherman or so pothead. Yeah. Or, or you're, you you know, a tattoo, a tattooed up tattoo artist. I mean, I've got a good friend that's a tattoo artist here in Atlanta and we fish together. And I mean, I'm nothing special. I'm, I'm a, I'm a fish bum. I fall more in the fish bum category than anything, but, uh, (laughs) But yeah, I mean, it's it's great. You got people from all different walks of life that have found it, and and when you're on the water, like man, we're all the same. It's an equalizer. That's for dang yeah. sure. That's kind of <laughs> how I live my life too. Like I don't like like flicks and and like these. I, I don't I don't know the word I'm looking for, but when people talk about like meeting different people and and you know being in different groups. I don't care who you are. If I can, if you can talk to me, we can get along. We can find something to get along with. I promise, because yeah. we're all the same. Yeah. <laughs> we might, some make more money than others. Some like to do different things than others. But at the end of the day, we're all the same. We're all yeah. here doing the same thing. So, I, I tell you what, man. That's like you're talking about that that uh, employee of Scoff being the the bridge. I feel like fly fishing in itself is a bridge. You know, to a lot of people, a, a lot of you know, and I don't know, just getting a little philosophical here for a second. I wish we could think about the things that are more alike than that, that divide us, you know, right. in, in a lot of ways, you know, sometimes there's a, there's a lot of, a uh, lot of strife in the world. And, um, you know, we can come to that common ground. A lot of times there'll be a lot less junk going on. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely, definitely agree with that. I mean, I think that's the thing. That's what was really behind that question is I've noticed is it's like they're, I mean, they are very different, you know, party lines, you know, in those groups, like they are, couldn't be more different, but the one thing that, that seems to bring us together or, you know, is a love for this sport and, and a love for fly fishing. And I love it. That's one of the, the things that I've discovered that I really love about the sport is, is how much uh, it unifies people. When people find out you do it, they're like, Oh man, really? How'd you learn how to do that? I mm-hmm. never, you know, I didn't know anything about it, you know, and I didn't either, you know, I'm one of those cliche guys that saw a river run still and thought that is beautiful. <laughs> how do I do that? Robert Redford. <laughs> <laughs> man, I want to learn how to shadow cast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, I, I would look like one of them girls in the marching band with a flag. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just waving that thing all around with a hook in my ear. Um, Done that. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> what, uh, what are coming, sort of bringing it back to the Southern culture on the fly in this publication, what are for, for you guys, what are the ingredients of a story for what you guys are looking for when it comes to your publication? I mean, looking for, you know, something, it's gotta be interesting, obviously. Um, we want either the story to be Southern based, right. Or can be anywhere else based coming from a Southern perspective. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, we've okay. got, we've had some guys uh, write, write some stories about out West. They're guys that are from the South. Uh, we've, you know, had some people that are from, you know, all over or New York, whatever, write some stuff about fishing in the South. And that's kind of mm-hmm. what it is. Want something good. Um, but it's got to be part of that Southern culture. Uh, we think it's special. You know, I've lived, like you said, I've kind of lived all over. I lived in Colorado and Wyoming and then I've lived all around the South and uh, there's something special about the South. There's no doubt about it. There's no place like it. Yeah, I certainly would agree with that. So, you know, a lot of your, you know, the nature of storytelling is reflective in, in, and it's, you know, some of the, the a lot of the stories that are kind of in, in scoff are, are reflective in nature. Um, you've you just mentioned that you've been all over the South. You've been all over, lived in some some of the, I guess some of the biggest fly fishing parts of the country. You know, Wyoming, Montana, Colorado. Um, when you're on the water, I don't think I think it's it's hard not to reflect. Um, are there any turning points in your life where, you know, at the outdoors and reflection kind of collided to kind of make you drawn to something like scoff? Hmm. That's a good question. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. No, but, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. That's a good question though. I'd have to think about that one a little bit more. Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah. Should have sent that one to you before you. Yeah, yeah. my bad. I, I <laughs> dropped the ball dead, on that. Man. One. My brain doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the easy questions? <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Well, we did have our favorite easy one. Is 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 always uh, uh, we're sitting around a campfire. We all, we often will will call this podcast a, a digital campfire, and there's nothing like sitting around a fire and and sharing stories. Um, if you find yourself around a fire, what is your what is your go to your go to story? It can be funny, it can be serious. Um, like we said, or in the pre show conversation, yeah. Uh, we always love a good bear story. So, you know, if you got bear stories, we're always game for that. But it doesn't always have up to be for a bear, bear story. Definitely. It doesn't definitely. have to be a bear story at all. Um, You know, some – one of the bear story – so one of my bear stories we like to tell is uh, my, my friend Scott, who's in the magazine with me. Scott and I have been friends for years. Um, one part, part I didn't touch on is uh, when I stopped working at Riverwoods, I actually opened up my own fly shop in North Alabama what? and it was in Huntsville. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I had, it was called Bailey outfitters and uh, it was in Madison, actually not Huntsville, but nobody at the time really knew Madison. So uh, it, it was you know, Huntsville based, but in Madison and that's where Scott and I met. Uh, I had the fly shop and he started, he was up there living and working and started coming in there and we became buddies and he'd stay and help. And um, we went on a trip, uh, there was a guy, Steve Carter. He was um, a guide up there. He had Black Lab Outfitters, and he uh, he got it over here in Georgia, North Georgia. So one day, he and Scott and I, we loaded up, and we we're going to go over here to fish, and uh, we we're going to fish Noon Tootla Creek. I'm not sure if y'all have ever fished it. It's a small little creek in in North Georgia mountains around Blue Ridge. Yep, um, really neat little place. But we're up there, and we park. Steve takes off, goes up the road. Scott and I are like, well, we're just going to hang out fish together. So we take off and walk down the, down the road a little bit, hit a trail, hit the creek, and we're wading up the creek. And it's tight, and the fish has been tough. We're catching some fish, but not a lot. We're having a good time. Keep getting this real weird whiff, and I'm, I'm telling them. Well, musky. Well, musky has suck. I don't know. And it gets stronger. And then it'd go away. And then it gets stronger. And that's a bear. You know, that ain't no bear. It's a bear. <laughs> he's like, he's like, I think it's a bear. And then I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. We we can repo and there's a cave. It's coming from this cave. And I'm like, dude, we need to get out of here. He was like, Yeah, we need to get out of here. So we we cross the river, walk back down, come out. We walk back up to the top of the hill, <laughs> and we're walking up there. We're telling Steve, he's like, there "Ain't no bears." And I said, "We get in the truck, we start heading. Here comes a mama, right across the road with two cubs, oh. right in front of us, <laughs> right where the cave was." Well, you just so, missed missed that. Oh one. my gosh, I was like, "Oh yeah, there's no bears." Yeah, so, no bears, no bears. <laughs> hey, that's, so that's a distinct, my only bear story. <laughs> that's a distinct smell, though. Like for oh, real. Man. I know, it man. It it was. We it smelled was it while we were there, Brad. I was just thinking that, Brian. That that first time with Chase when we were we we discovered it. That was that weekend that we discovered it. Yep. Because that's uh, Sam. That's where we went back and and filmed. Oh, was it okay? The, the, that's where the YouTube film yeah. was filmed at. I thought some of that looked familiar. Yeah. Oh, what a beautiful place, man! So beautiful much. Place. There's so many beautiful creeks like that all over up there between north georgia and north carolina it's yeah man it's such but, it's pretty neat but yeah that first that that first time that we went to the new Tutlo with chase and um who i was with us he was he up there with us that time yeah. when we we were supposed to fish but man it had gosh it had rained and rained and it had blown the tacoa out we were supposed to fish with these guides and we ended up on this lake bass fishing and it was terrible ben was with was, us on that one but yeah, Ben was with. We didn't catch a bass. We didn't catch any. Oh, we, it was terrible. Um, but anyway, but we discovered the the redeeming thing was we discovered the Nantutla, and it was gorgeous. I mean, yeah. what a beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful place. It is. It's amazing up there. There's That's a lot cool. of them. Like I said, actually, Nantutla's terrible. Do not go there. 
there's a lot of better creeks everywhere else. So yeah, it's so <laughs> tight. It's, it's little. The tight. fish are tiny. Oh, yeah. You're gonna lose all your fit, all your flies. They're um, bears. They're bears. bears. The bears. Don't go there. So it's real hard Sam, to find. As a, as a father, um, have you gotten your your children into outdoors? Are they what are they kind of? Uh, where where are they in the in this spectrum? I know that you're on the you're you're at a ten as an outdoorsman. But where are they on the spectrum? There, they're pretty low on it. They're interested. Yeah, um, it's funny because it comes and goes, right? So my daughter, um, when she was little, we lived in Wyoming, and she was in like kindergarten. Uh, I see, pre K kindergarten, first grade in Wyoming. And so she would go out with me and she would sit in the blind, the antelope hunting, or she, we would go fishing a lot. And, I, and, you know, she would get out and fish with me and always had fun. And I was like, man, I'm going to have a little fisher, fisher woman. And then we moved back uh, to the Southeast and uh, she just kind of lost interest in it. And it was uh, maybe partly my fault. You know, I, I'm kind of, I'm in it and I'm kind of full bore in it. So my trips are not yeah. always kid friendly trips. Yeah. So, uh, but I always would try to take them and then they would be like, Hey dad, I want to go fishing. I'm like, all right, cool. I've got this trip this weekend. Let's go next weekend. And then they're like, no, I want to go on your trip with you. I'm like, you can't go on this trip with me. This is a trip with a bunch of guys and we're going, you know, out of the, you know, camping for four days. This is not a kid's trip. Mm -hmm. Next weekend we'll go next weekend comes along. No, I don't want to go. Mm -hmm. So I dealt mm. with that and, and I've never really found a great way to manage that. Now my son, he is uh 14 now and he is full into sports. He plays football, he wrestles, he plays tennis, and he plays baseball. I mean, busy with sports and has played sports his whole life. So he's gone with me quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Um but he finds his love in sports right now and mm -hmm. he enjoys it. We were actually supposed to do a trip uh, this weekend. Um, we always, for the last three years, we've done a, a guy's trip on Martin Luther King weekend um, to the mountains and got a cabin with a, a couple other uh, dads and their kids and mm. it didn't work out this year, but uh, he always looks forward to that trip. And we always have a lot of fun, catch some big old, pellet trout private private water trout and it's fun <laughs> and they love it and it's awesome it gets them fired up but he's the it's funny because he'll get into he really likes to bass fish mm -hmm. um so you know one summer covid was amazing for him because the sports had been shut down everything else he mm -hmm. would jump on his bicycle and brian I, earlier i was telling you about you know how our neighborhood and our this little area cartersville georgia is so great it, you almost feel like you're knocked back you know 20 years, but he would jump on his bicycle. He'd grab his two rods and his backpack uh, um, tackle box and ride through out of our neighborhood, through the park into his buddy's neighborhood. And they'd fish all day. Oh man. Is there a better life? Is I there, mean, I know that's a good childhood right there. Yeah, it is. Oh. And they did that all. So I was like, you know, as bad as COVID was, it was like, man, it kind of jumped, you know, jumped them back in time. It was great. That's um, oh, God, and he that's still awesome. likes it. And he, he's getting, he, he goes through his phases where he's like, Hey, I'm ready. Let's go fishing. And then man, he, only fly fishing he really wants to do is for trout, though. He hadn't figured out bluegill and bass yet and, or salt water. He wants to use a spinning rod for everything else. Yeah. <laughs> what's, um, what's the one thing? All right. This is going to be another one of those hard ones. So brace yourself. What's the one thing <laughs> you want your children to say about you when they're older? Oh, wow. And I'm not gonna let you get off the hook about all you're gonna tell me no, later. You're gonna one. you're gonna make uh <laughs> so another I'm a I'm an emotional person too. Um man, hey, I'm yeah. right there with you. Give me a I good would be, Hallmark uh, movie or something. If uh <laughs> well I want them, you know, I hope they know that I love them. And mm -hmm. I hope they uh they'll say that I was uh obviously that I was a very loving and that I was fun and that is a tough one. You know what? That I was a good person mm -hmm. and a great dad. That's what I hope they say about me. Wow. I hope I hope mine say that about me too. <laughs> thank you for saying thank you for answering that one. Yeah, yes, sir. What fourteen year old son? I mean, I, I haven't gotten there yet. My son's ten. My daughter's fourteen. 
Yeah. You know, in a world that has questions about like manhood, what is a man? And there's all kinds of, you know, there's huge debate there. What's a, what, what are a couple of qualities that, that you're like, you're like, you, you kind of see your son starting to become a man. What are a couple of things that, that you're, you're working on? You're like, this, this is what I want my son to be or know what a man is. So this is, this is actually funny that you asked this because um, we're doing some work around the house, uh, changing out some fixtures, updating. We got a little construction going on that I told you guys about. And um, th- this isn't, you know, just a man, but it's doing man things, right? We, we, uh, we're changing out a bunch of <laughs> hardware on our doors, put new door, doorknobs and everything else on. He, he's asking to help me. So I'm like, yeah, sure. Come on, let's go. And we're, we're, you know, he's using a screwdriver. We're doing this. My wife and I, we go out to eat dinner with some friends. He calls me. He's like, Hey dad, is this right? And I look and he's redone three doors all himself. Oh, wow. <laughs> so like, yes. that's, let's go. That's probably like, Hey, look, you're, you're, you're doing it right now. Right. Take initiative. initiative. That's it. Man. Yeah. That's it. Golly. You can't teach yeah. that. I uh, know. So that's, that's big. And yeah, that's, that's one of the big ones. But That's also, awesome. like you know, like like I just said, is like, I think you know, manhood, you know, it is about being a man, being able to take care of yourself, take care of your family, um, you know, kind of be a protector. But you, know, I think manhood also is being a good person, treating mm-hmm. people with respect. Um, yeah. You know, no matter their background or who they are, or you know what's going on. I think that's a big part about being a man. So I hope I hope he's. Okay. I think he is. I feel like he is. Um, and I, I hope he's seeing that from me. So I love that. Man. Well done. Be respectful and take initiative. Well, if we had more men that did that. We'd be in good shape, wouldn't we? That's right. Mm-hmm. Thinking of others, putting others before yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm. And that was something that I, we loved so much. We were talking earlier, you know, you're talking about Metter, Jimbo Metter. And that was, you know, something that was big and very important to him was like treating others, you know, better than yourself. And yeah. And it was, it was so encouraging how many people, you know, would, would reach out to us and say, man, that wasn't, he wasn't just, that's not lip service. Like that yeah. really is who he, you know, that's how he treated them. And so, man, it was so encouraging. So gosh, thanks for sharing that, man. Uh, I wish just, I knew, or sorry, I didn't mean to cut ahead. you off. No, I, say, I wish I had gotten to know him better. I, I got to meet him a few times uh, when I worked with Craig um, and always was just a, uh, cool to be around and I was 25 years, 24 years ago, 23 years ago, but, yeah. um, it, he was really neat to be around. And then all the stories that I heard, you know, about him from Craig and some other people around me and just such a cool guy. And yeah. I think I told you this, I think I wrote you a little, a little note, uh, but you run, you, you, you stole my thunder when you, when y'all got him on y'all's podcast. Cause that was on my list. I have this list I've been writing out through the years of people to interview <laughs> that have never been on a podcast and he was at the top. <laughs> hey, there's still more stories for him. Oh, to tell. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Holy mackerel. No, I was just joking. I was so, I was so thrilled and tickled that y'all got him. And it was just, oh man, it made my day. I've listened to it like three times. So. Oh man. That, that's awesome. <laughs> Uh-oh. And the second time we we talked with him was yeah. as good. As I, I haven't listened to the second because you know, he shared. Have y'all put that out yet? I've not been. Yeah, I've been yeah. on a so podcast episode. hiatus here uh, in the last month. I've not listened to any podcast for like. A oh man! Well, there's a gem waiting for you. So okay, good. Episode 100. Gosh, it was. He told some really funny stories, yeah. man. Yeah, they were all. They were. They were new. Oh they were my new gosh. stuff. There were some new things. It was yeah. funny. Well, I'm going to be on the road quite a while tomorrow if this weather holds out, and so I'll have to give it a listen. It's worth it. It was we were laughing out loud. I mean, you know, he he was more. I felt like he had he'd gotten more comfortable with us, and he was real real relaxed. And uh, yeah, he uh, he shared some good ones. It was That's awesome. man, I still laugh <laughs> about him. I, I wanted okay. a step back real quick because y'all were asking me about my kids and fishing. The another cool thing is my daughter who is 17. And I said she'd never really got interested in it since since us, you know, taking over for uh, scoff. She's all of a sudden kind of gotten a little interested in it. Oh, this and then, cool. this is kind of yeah, cool, Dad. Yeah, exactly. And then she met Mary Beth at the fly show last year in yes. Rock and Robin, and she was like, "Oh, they're super cool." So there's nothing cooler like, than that pair right there. Yeah. 
this might be cool, you know? So <laughs> she asked me, so I took her fishing. It was a horrible day of fishing I mean, and she didn't have a lot of time, but it was after school on a Wednesday or Thursday. Anyways, we went to the river and we had gotten a bunch of rain. The river was just blown out muddy, but we still went and fished and had fun for about two hours. And then I took her to a small creek that shall remain nameless in North Georgia. And we went up there and waited for a day and, and caught some trout together. So, and she's ready for the next trip. So she is getting more interested now. And I, and I won't say it's really scoff, but scoff introduced us to some of these, these women in, in fly fishing that are so awesome. And so that's been a blessing too. Yeah. I love that mo- the, the movement of getting uh, more women on the, on the water. Um, yes. I, I just think it's good for the sport. I think it's good for everything. Um, I, and, and what they're, what, Robin's doing what Mary Beth's doing, uh, you know, Sarah, you know, all those, mm-hmm. those ladies are, are just doing some fantastic work yeah, and, uh, they really are. Can't say enough about them. Yeah, they are. They're doing some really cool stuff. So hopefully we'll see some more, uh, some more stories about some of the stuff they're doing, uh, this coming year, maybe. I loved, yeah. uh, I love the dorsal films, uh, the triple tail thing that they did. That was pretty cool. Yeah. I've got to watch it. I've saw some of the little, you know, snippets of it uh i was down there when they were shooting it though so that was cool oh that's awesome so, i hope to I hope to get to do that next year yeah it's a fun it's a very fun event they they put on a really good thing down there so i gotta learn how to catch them first but i got a skiff baby i mean you don't have to catch them just have fun <laughs> y'all think fishing's about catching fish oh no no we don't <laughs> oh that's awesome if I ever start, if I ever, you know, start judging my trips on how many fish I caught, man, I'm probably not going to be fishing very much. Yeah. No. I've learned that about, I've, I've duck hunted for the first time this year. It's a duck hunt is real similar down here in the, in the, yeah. in the South. Not, we're not talking Arkansas duck hunt. We're talking mobile Delta duck hunting. So oh, yeah. yeah, if you judge it by how many you bring home, you'd be struggling. That's right. <laughs> for sure. Well, man, uh, <clears throat> All right, Sam, you, you spent a lot of time fly fishing for, for years now. You got five, you can have five flies in your box. What are your favorite, your favorite five flies? Five flies in my box for, for all fishing, no matter where. This is what you, this is what you need. Okay. From five flies, you got to have a clouser minnow because you can catch fish on clouser minnow pretty much anywhere you go. Mm -hmm, Right. Saltwater, freshwater, you know, trout, bass, everything. Um, so this is a this is one that I don't know if y'all have probably ever been told, but an articulated goldie. An never articulated seen, goldie is one. it is a uh, it's basically a double woolly booger, but it's it's white with gold chenille and a cone head, and it's articulated, so it's two of them. Oh and man! I literally caught I think twenty five. I think I counted twenty five different species of fish all over uh, the country and in Alaska with it. Um, fresh salt everything yeah so it's it's just a bait fish pattern it's super simple but it's a lot of action because of that because it's double right exactly yeah it's awesome all right uh boogle bug Mm -hmm. and any color as long as it's uh chartreuse chartreuse (laughs) (laughs) if if i really had to pick one color it's gonna be uh the olive green but but uh but yeah chartreuse is definitely a solid one (laughs) <laughs> um let's see man uh yeah two left man i know no, two left this is left. tough this is tough uh two left what do i fish with the most so going trout i've got to have a parachute atoms right because that's because it's a parachute atoms <laughs> yeah you can catch trout on it anywhere right uh and then my last one because i want to go out west and catch trout is going to be a chubby Chernobyl. Oh, that's what I like to hear. There we go. Oh, that's yep. a great list. Great list, man. That's, I, I, that might, that man, that's going to be uh, hard to top. That is tough to top. That's a good list. So, yeah. That's, that's awesome. great, because man. I can tie a Klausner menu and so many different variations to catch redfish, trout. You can catch, you can tie a big one for tarpon. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's so good. What um? What about favorite favorite species to catch? Man, you're gonna laugh at me. Bass. I love I spotted mean, bass, largemouth bass. All good. All Smallmouth good. probably are my favorite all around, but I don't have them real close to me. But uh, seeing I a seeing a, a big 
bass smash something on top. There, I mean, there's just very little like it. I mean, yeah. what's that thing Jimbo says? Where that Papa was. Where that That's Papa right. was. <laughs> that Papa was. <laughs> it's it's all. I mean, look, it, it's all about going back to your roots, right? Yep. It's the simple thing. I can do it in my backyard. And I can do it all day and have a blast. And it's also the one thing that most people in fly fishing haven't done. Mm. You're which right. Kind of wild, right? You're that's right. True. Every, yeah, everybody true. goes trout or yep. salt water. You know, they don't go for bass, and they're just. Cool. And that's anywhere you know, nearly anywhere in the country, right? I mean, yeah, it is. And river bass are, are the, you know, for me, are the most special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're awesome. Good man. Well, what's uh, what's your next adventure, man? What's next on the horizon for you, Sam? I'd like to be telling you about this trip I'm supposed to be leaving for Wednesday to the Chandelier Islands, but it just got canceled. So oh. <laughs> the weather is oh. not our friend. No, you know, thirty mile per hour winds. They don't like you know, don't necessarily like that coming straight out of the north on a houseboat in the middle of the islands down in Mississippi and Louisiana. You for so. real? You for real? <laughs> yeah, no, right? yeah, I don't know. Seems like fun to me. But, uh, yeah, yeah, so that was supposed to happen. We were supposed to leave Wednesday for that, but uh, we got the fly fishing show coming up in yeah. February, and we'll have a booth there. Come see us. Um, love for you guys to come hang out for a little bit if y'all are coming over this year. Um, we, hadn't, we hadn't said we were going to or not, but we yeah, should, though. Probably should, yeah. It's going to be a big show. And until that weekend again? Uh, it's the first weekend of February. I think it's the first, second, third, or second, first, third, second, third. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's cool. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, three days again. Um, you know, Friday night they'll have the uh, fly fishing film tour. Well, excuse me, what is it? The International Fly Fishing Film Fest or whatever. It's the IF4. They'll have that Friday night. So get your tickets. It's always a fun, fun show. Ben at the fly fishing show does a great job of putting these things together. He gets tons of tons of great vendors and, or, you know, companies to come out and, and show their product off for all the people. Um, it's just a fun time. It's like a giant gathering of our weird community. So it's, it's, it was a lot of fun last year. Yeah. I mean, we had yeah. a blast. We did. We did have a great time. It's a great time. So, so that's coming up. Um, I'm trying to think I've got, Hmm. I don't have any big trips other than that one playing right now. We've got uh, the sheepy. Uh, is down in Louisiana. I'm fishing it with my good friend Jason Shepard, who's uh, a guy down in Panama City. We're going over to fish it together in March. I think it's like the second weekend of March. Mm. So that'll be a big one. That's a lot of fun. And then uh, just wait. You, you want to catch? You want to catch sheep's head with a guy named Shepard? That's right. <laughs> well, Pretty well good, played. right? Well played, sir. <laughs> wow. So. Yeah, go ahead and place your bets early. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're uh yeah. I I'll, I'll bet I'll bet on you guys. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well man, this has been a fun conversation. Um Sam, what uh where can people find uh Southern Culture on the Fly? So we're Southern Culture on the Fly dot com. Uh, we're on Instagram at Southern Culture on the Fly. I think there's a Facebook. We don't do much in the Twitter world or any of that stuff, but uh, yeah, southernculturalonthefly.com. It's free to subscribe. Uh, well, shameless plug. Jump absolutely, on absolutely. Yeah, sure. and how can people support your work, though? I mean, you, you, it's free to subscribe, and it's something that's online. But how can people support your work? So we have right now. I think our merch store is down because we've got a couple shows coming up, and we're trying to get everything ready for that. Uh, but we do sell t-shirts, hats, stickers. Um, yeah, give us a like on Instagram. Support us that way. Mm-hmm. Share it and tell your friends about us. And uh, we want to keep it free. You know, it's free yeah. for the people. Supported by advertisers. That's great. If there's yeah. people Shop. who are listening who are um, ever you know, have a product or something that they would like to advertise, uh, is there a is there something we could put in our show notes that they could contact you? Yeah, definitely. They can uh, shoot, shoot me an email at Southern Cultural on the Fly. Or excuse me. Sam at Southern Culture on the Fly. Nice. Okay. Nice. Yeah, yeah. We'll put, put that, that in show notes. Home. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we definitely appreciate that. And yeah, if you, you're out there, support the get the people that support us and tell them that, uh, that we sent you. Nice. Yeah. Well, Sam, That's I great. really appreciate your, you, you taking time with us. Um, and it's, it's, and I hope we hope our paths cross again soon. And, uh, Brad's going to close us out here. 
Oh awesome. man, that's yeah. Again, you know, just thanks for carving out some time to share your story and uh, share some stories, man. And uh, we're we're thankful for uh, guys like you and and you know a publication like that that does do what we love to do, and that's write stories down, share those stories, and inspire them. I mean, they're beautiful stories. They're captured beautifully in photography, which is something Brian and I are real passionate about. And so it really is a joy, uh, a joy to to check out every time you know an issue comes out. I enjoy seeing it, and it's both pleasing to the eye, and it's also um, a challenging read and very well written. I've always been real impressed with the writing um, within Southern Culture on the Fly, and I know that comes from a wide range of of people, but man, it's really well put together. And so kudos to you guys for a great Thank product you. and and uh, and sharing sharing those stories with us and uh, we hope these conversations today's conversations inspires you know somebody to to write their story to share their adventures in the place we love to call the storied outdoors if you've enjoyed this podcast please take some time to leave us a review or better yet share it with a friend we hope these stories encourage you encourage you to write your own stories and share your own adventures in the storied outdoors